Welcome to the conversation. Our guest today is Anthony Torres. He is a professor here at Binghamton University. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, professor Torres uh, went to Oxford University in 1966. Uh, uh, well, that's when I actually I got my degree. I actually went there mm -hmm. in, uh, in 59-60. I got one, my first degree there was in 62. Oh. And uh, it, I got a, another BA, a second BA, and uh, in Oxford, if you get a BA and you wait around and you don't do bad things, <laughs> then you automatically get an MA after four years, and so that happened in 66. Oh, very nice. Yes. And then you went on to uh, John Hopkins University. That's right, that's right. And you did doctorates there? That's correct. Now, what was your um, doctorates on? What was your Aristotle's biology. Oh, interesting. So can you tell us, the viewers, more about that? Well, uh, at that time, there was, of, of Aristotle's work, the biological works were very little mm -hmm. emphasized. Mm -hmm. And um, so I chose to work on the biological work, partly because they hadn't been emphasized very much, partly because I was working with um, a very distinguished teacher at Johns Hopkins, Ludwig Edelstein, who had written a great deal on ancient Greek medicine. Okay. And so to work with Edelstein, uh, it was a good thing to work on biology and relating it to medical texts, Hippocratic medical texts, mm -hmm. and also some of the critiques of Aristotle by Galen. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in that general territory, ancient, ancient medicine, uh, philosophy of ancient bi biology and medicine. That's what I was doing. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're actually my professor in uh, philosophy of medical ethics. Yes. And we discuss a lot of philosophical um, theses in terms of medical ethics. Yes. Um, now, what's interesting, you know, it being an election year, you know, healthcare is a huge issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, it, it, it's been made so by uh, the fact that, of course, a few years ago, when Obama did have a majority in Congress, he put through. Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act, which everyone calls Obamacare. Yes. And um, despite the fact that it was just a dead imitation of what Romney had put through, Romney, a Republican governor, put through in Massachusetts, the Republicans decided, because they don't like Obama, that they hated Obamacare. They didn't offer really much of an alternative you know, they just said, no, we have to repeal the whole thing. And they voted, you know, like a gazillion times yeah. <laughs> to repeal Obamacare. Mm -hmm. uh, never suggesting what they would do instead, ever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, uh, as it's turned out, you know, it even without their support and, you know, like hampering the development in all the ways that they possibly could, it's had some positive effects. We talked that about, about that in class today. Uh, you know, it's kind of brought down the cost of uh, the general cost of medical care. It's increased the number of people who are insured, mm -hmm. uh, reduced the disparity in insurance between uh, different ethnic groups somewhat. Uh, so true, yeah. so all of those things are very positive <laughs> yeah. about, about it. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the one cartoon that I showed in class of the elephant your Republican elephant sort of celebrating the downfall of Obamacare, and he looks really distressed because I mean, well now what am I going to do? It. Yeah. I mean, if they really succeeded, what would they do? So, in terms of the law, you know, I'm able to stay under my mom's insurance sure. until I'm 26, which yeah. is great. <laughs> yeah, yes, um, yes. <laughs> now speaking to uh, you know millennials and sort of the college yeah. uh, student, you know, there's there's certain libertarians you know around the country and yes. most conservatives. Um, who have this philosophical view that the government should be very limited. Now, there is this, they call it like a Ponzi scheme in a way, um, in a sense that when dealing with insurance, you have like a risk pool where yeah. sort of like the young people be paid into it and most yeah. of the costs go towards end of care, like and sure. chronic diseases. Sure. Um, and I have no problem with that, but philosophically, what do you think about the people who believe that, you know what, uh, the government shouldn't be in our business? Well, think about it in terms of car insurance, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, it's the same Ponzi scheme in that you like. Some of us never have accidents. Mm. 
very careful drivers. We don't drive fast. We don't break the law. We don't bump into stuff. But we still pay insurance, right? Mm -hmm. And what does our insurance go to pay? Well, it goes to pay the accidents that bad drivers <laughs> keep getting into. Uh, but I still think, you know, like that's that's how insurance works. That 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 is to say, you've got to have some people who are going to pay in that aren't going to take out as much mm -hmm. because there's some other ones. What are you insuring for? You're insuring for people who have to pay a lot for some reason. Yeah. And and health insurance is really, li I mean, you know, even more so than car insurance because if if people have a severe illness. Um, it can cost them a lot of money in a big hurry. Yeah. And so, you know, people think, oh, you know, I'm healthy. I'm going to, I'm not going to get sick. But you never know what's going to happen next, you know. And so, so you really, uh, I mean, we've learned, everywhere has learned that uh, you want to have people have some kind of insurance of, mm -hmm some description whether it's government insurance or private insurance or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, but otherwise you're going to have people who really are not going to be able to get the medical care that they need you there's the limits on on uh, charity care mm -hmm. are very severe it's true that we have a law that hospitals have to admit people even if they don't have insurance but it doesn't say what they have to do with them, and they're not going to give them a bunch of expensive stuff going in, you know, if they can help it. Yeah. So, yeah. Y you know, th there's going to be a difference between, I guess you could say, charity care, yeah. where people don't have any support at all, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, of course, and, and, of course, you could say, all right, so mm -hmm. we don't want the, the government to do it. Well, actually what we have is a very interesting combination of government supported care uh, via Medicare, of course, Medicaid, but we also have uh, these insurance exchanges which really say you have to buy health insurance. Well, it's sort of like not that different from car insurance. If you're going to drive a car, mm -hmm. you have to have insurance on your car, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you're going to live, you need health insurance, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? You know, you're going to stay alive, uh, you know, because living has the risk of getting sick and, yeah. and having accidents and so on. So, um, so it, it's like normal that you should do that. And in fact, what we have, it, as I say, it was a Republican system. Mm -hmm. It was not, it's not the way the Democrats want it, okay? Mm -hmm. Not most of them. I mean, certainly not the way that, Bernie wants it, you know yeah. what I'm saying, and you because you've heard his, his rhetoric, yeah. but uh, uh, but it, it's the Republican system is what we have actually. It, it's what Romney put in in Massachusetts, and what it says is you have to have insurance. We will help you find an insurance company. We'll give you some choices of different insurance, you know, mm -hmm. but you have to have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now it's it's, it's interesting. Um, a lot of Another, a lot of cars, like you mentioned, is sort of like people who don't have insurance. Yeah. They go in in the emergency room. Yeah. And it sure. sort of racks up the bill. And yes, um, yes. One of the ways to decrease the cost is, of course, preventative measures. Of course. So meaning seeing a regular physician. Um, yes. But the problem yeah. is, my aunt, she's uh, a nurse practitioner. Yeah. And what happens is, certain practices don't accept Medicaid. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's another problem. Obviously, that's a very serious issue. And uh, yes, I. I I agree. Um, how do we do that? And and I suppose you could say, well, you have to get the reimbursement for for Medicaid up to a level that that practices will accept it. Mm -hmm. That's on the one side. On the other side, I think we really do have sort of a shortage of primary care physicians, particularly, obviously, in areas where there are large numbers of Medicaid patients. Because people aren't, they, like, you got, a medi you got an MD, now where are you going to make money, right? Mm -hmm. and, you're and, and it's not going to be being a primary care physician in, a, in an area where everybody's on Medicaid. It's just not gonna, you're not going to make money that way, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that this is, a, this is a problem that our system hasn't adequately addressed. The way that you address it, it's, as I say, really two-pronged. Number one, increase the number 
of primary care physicians and how do you do that? I think of probably give support for medical school mm -hmm. to people who are committed mm -hmm. and would be say required mm -hmm. to go ahead and practice in those areas. And then we have some of that, mm -hmm. maybe not enough. Uh, you, you know, we already have really kind of a nice system for people who want to get a medical degree. If you go into, I into military medicine, the military will pay a lot, for, you know, and you're committed to doing military medicine for a period of time, they'll pay for a lot of your medical ex school expenses, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way that you're going to do it. Because yep. otherwise people are going to say, look, if I, got, if I go, you know, $100,000, $200,000 in debt, mm -hmm. I can't go into a practice that I'm only going to make $30,000 a year. <laughs> it, doesn't make, it doesn't make economic sense, right? right. I've, I've got to, I've got to make, I don't know, like two hundred thousand dollars a year, you know. Mm -hmm. So how am I going to do that? Get a good specialist, you know, be a specialist in something, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, I know this intimately. My son is a is an anesthesiologist, and his wife is OBGYN. OBGYN don't make that much money, but she wants to do it. Mm -hmm. So they well, but they're married. Anesthesiologists make plenty of money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my son makes the money, and she does what she loves, and they're happy. Right, but this is a, um, but they're neither one of them are primary care physicians, and they just think, well, why would I do that? You know, like mm -hmm. I have I have debts. I, you know, I have to pay back my my loans, mm -hmm. all that. Yeah, and, and that sort of comes around into you know our institution in terms of higher education, the sure. cost of it. Yeah, that's right. Which is really high. Yes. Well, fortunately, I mean, like state university Binghamton is not so high, but it, when you get into private universities, get. Yeah. I mean, it still is too much here, but you know what happens? The state doesn't support, doesn't doesn't give us a, a, a enough money, and uh, to some extent is mitigated a little bit by the kinds of of uh, scholarships and loans and so on that they will offer to people on a needs based basis. Mm -hmm. Surely not enough, but it, it but at least it helps for people to go, so that we can offer here in Binghamton we can offer. Mm -hmm a good education at a reasonable price and in fact we get we're listed among the top 50 if we're a good buy you know in the, the, the universities in the country and and it's because of that because if you you know like if you say well um, oh, why can't i go to syracuse university well it costs you a lot more money or, or cornell it costs you a lot more money that's why yeah. <laughs> you well, know? In, the, in the early 1960s when you're in oxford how yeah. much did it cost them i would assume well i was i, I was on a scholarship ah, okay. uh, and so and and the scholarship that i had paid the tuition i had no idea what the tuition was not actually i know it wasn't very much in those days even in private universities oxford has gone up a lot since then yeah. I, I did go to a private college but the, uh, in before that in Iowa, but uh, uh, when I went there, I could make enough money in the summer mm -hmm. working on construction mm -hmm. to pay pretty much all of my tuition mm -hmm. and, uh, and fees and stuff for the college. And of course today that even there, it's impossible, yeah. you know, because all the private colleges have just gone up, gone up so, so, so much. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I was talking with my wife. My wife was an undergraduate at Binghamton, mm -hmm. and um, she said that when she was an undergraduate, tuition was about $2,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? So... That that gives you an idea, and you know you know how it is now. There's much more, so yeah, yeah. so yeah. Two thousand is like a meal plan. <laughs> yeah, well, right, 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 and 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 so this is a, and 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 why do, why did that happen? Well, because the state doesn't want to give us the money. Why don't they want to give us the money? Because people complain about taxes, and where's the money going to come from? It's going to come from taxes. So you know you can say so you're libertarians that you mentioned before, and say taxes are too high. We don't want to pay for anything. Well, okay, so all the things are going to go up that the government is going to pay for it, you know, and, and or or the quality goes down. So like the quality, of, as you said, and it, there's a sense in which, yeah, there's Medicaid, but the quality of that is is hard to, you know, like because people, so only few people are going to accept it and, you know, all of that, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, what, what was interesting, um, you know, Michael Bloomberg said yeah. something very interesting in terms of the 
the spout. Uh, yeah. He wanted to get rid of the big soda uh, cans and the. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And what's interesting is that you know, if you, uh, I, I tend to believe if you're wealthy, you tend to be more healthy, you tend to be skinny. And what happens is those in poverty, in low-paying jobs, sure. uh, tend to go to fast food restaurants. And right. uh, it disproportionately affects minorities, the poor, and it creates a perpetual system. That's true. That's true. And, and, and really what that is, uh, is that your body is looking for certain kinds of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And um, your body is not that good at telling you which nutrition that it wants, mm -hmm. you know? So the easiest thing to get is calories. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, so you can get, you know, like a giant soda for, you know, like some, like 99 cents, you could get this huge thing, right? Okay, it's full of calories, but there's nothing else in it. Mm -hmm. And so, and your body is saying, whoa, I'm sifting through all this stuff, but I'm not finding anything very good in it. But in the meantime, you're packing those calories away in the form of fat. That's true. That's <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, okay, so taxing the big drinks, you, you, you could say, I mean, they're, they're make, it does make some kind of sense, but it really doesn't address the issue, which is, getting people to eat things that are actually going to physically satisfy their hunger, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and they, if they ate good food, if they ate real food, mm -hmm. they'd be much more satisfied with that mm -hmm. than, yeah. with a, that, than with a large soda and a big bag of potato chips, mm -hmm. you know? Very true, yeah. Right, so. And it, and it sort of goes into the role of government and yeah. uh, to what end should the government promote, you know, healthy habits. <laughs> well, well, of course. Yeah, they, well, you, they, promoting it, you could say, yes, uh, we want to have healthy people. I mean, I was talking today about, you know, like, let's, let's, we need to have healthy people in the country. <laughs> More healthy people is better for the country. Mm -hmm. So h what can you do to do that? And certainly education, propaganda, if you want to call it, mm -hmm. is uh, obviously part of the, part of the package. And, and, it, and you're not... You're not actually, at that point, you're not restricting any f anybody's freedom. I mean, if you say, well, you know, you should restrict what you are taking in in terms of empty calories, that does not prevent people from going and buying a big gulp, you know. I mean, they can, do, they can still do it, mm -hmm. you know. It just, uh, uh, but you do have to, I think that what we need to do is to think, how do we make, good food, mm -hmm. uh, available, affordable mm -hmm. to the people who aren't getting it. Because it really is true that uh, people who have more money, I mean, you don't have to really be rich, but you just, you know, like you have to be sort of rich enough and educated enough to know what is going to be good mm -hmm. and to get it and, <laughs> and, and, and to have your, you know, arrange your diet in that way. Uh, and, um, and so bringing people to the point where they realize that this is this is good you know yeah. and and i think that it does happen that some of the food programs which are helping people who who uh don't have we i mean we have uh, have chow and we've got catholic social services food pantry and so on mm -hmm. and some of these places you know do work at kind of encouraging people to select things that are going to be uh, healthier, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember a story that uh, they have this backpack program at Catholic Social Services. I mentioned this because it's just a few blocks from my house. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the children can go there from their elementary school on Friday and pick up um, – food for the weekend because, you know, they get fed in school because we have, there's a breakfast program and lunch program. So, so, so we're feeding a lot of these kids good food in school. Mm -hmm. But what about the weekend? Mm -hmm. You know, you're relying on their family. Maybe their family doesn't have any money and they're just running out of food stamps or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, so what we, we have there 
I mean, the people have, will provide food for And what they found is that, uh, that if they put in, you know, like hummus and, fr- and fruit and things like that, they can be like, man, yes, that's what I want. Give me more carrots, you know, <laughs> right? Because they, they eat it and they, get and they like it. And they say, that's, that's good. I really like that better than Twinkies. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, well it's interesting. Um, when Obama got elected, uh, I was in ninth grade. Yeah. And one of Michelle Obama's initiatives was to, to eat healthier. Yes, yes. And there was actually there was a group. Um, there was a, a group about they they deal with image. Yeah. And they yeah. they saw Michelle Obama's campaign to sure. to uh, get children more healthy as sort of um, being against obese people and yeah. sort of image shaming <laughs> and sort of no. making sure you know. <laughs> uh, Promoting an agenda, and um, it's interesting how when you talk about health, yeah, it almost it parallels image in yeah. the sense that you know now certain schools they they have a report card yeah. where the ch- where a child receives their weight yeah. and they're like you you are obese yeah. You know? Yeah. Which, which is a fact in terms of the scale. Yeah. But then it brings up another philosophical issue of, you know, identity or being not shaming. Yeah. yeah. And I feel that's where the parallels lie between, you know, health and health. Well, right. Okay. And, and it may be that, um, you know, the question is always here, we're putting pressure on them. Now, at what point is it undue pressure? How do you decide what undue pressure is? Right, um, it's. L- let me compare something else. For we, you know, uh, s- smoking cigarettes. Uh, when I was in high school, everybody was smoking cigarettes. I mean, it was like everywhere, and in restaurants, and you know, like buses and trains, and you know, library. Our library here on campus, when I first started teaching here, people smoked in the library, <laughs> you know, and, and in classroom. I mean, I had I had students sitting in class puffing away <laughs> at, in, in my lecture, right? Yeah. Okay, so, and, 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 and this has changed. Okay, so how did it change? Well, okay, so we, we s- started, you know, with uh, limiting where you could smoke and just a certain amount of... Uh, you know, like <laughs> telling people if they smoked, there it was going to be bad for them, and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's had an effect. Of course, you still have some people who are smoking, but way less, and what, and and not, you know, like it's much, 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 much less. Mm-hmm. And and what the consequence of that would be is. Well, uh, that's going to have a positive effect on health because we know that a lot of diseases, a lot of cancers particularly, and some other kinds of heart disease, um, are consequent on smoking cigarettes. Right. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so, so by reducing that, and, and so the, 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 the thing about the large soft drinks, sugary drinks, is, is a little bit parallel to the cigarette thing. Now, of course, one of the things about the cigarettes, you could say, well, it impinges on the rights of other people because if there's if if, if I'm sitting in a restaurant and people right in the table next to me are puffing away, I'm getting all that smoke, and so it's it's hurting me, mm-hmm. right? And y- you know, on airplanes, right? You could say we got rid of the cigarettes on airplanes by saying we're making the stewardesses sick. You are there for a couple hours. They're there all the time, you know, and they're breathing in the smoke too, and then and that's so they're going to get sick from from the, the smoke, and that idea that you're affecting other people, I think, is a kind of persuasive thing as far as cigarettes are concerned. Not so persuasive with <laughs> drinking <laughs> supersized drinks, you know, right? Yeah. Now, uh, education is a major thing in terms yeah. of uh, you mentioned smoking, yeah, um, and when you started teaching, people were just uneducated about the risks. And yeah, uh, it, it, well, or, or they knew about them and basically didn't care. I have to say that when you're talking to, say, college-age students, I would say that most college-age students are not terribly concerned about risks of anything. Mm-hmm. Okay? 
So, you know, I mean, look, they go to State Street and drink too much, right? Which is not a terribly good idea, right? They will even get in a car and drive it after having had lunch to drink, right? Very dangerous, you, you, you know? Or uh, some of them will will take drugs that are, uh, you know, ha maybe have some temporary positive effect, but long term is kind of not, not good, you know? And if they, everybody is, uh, it, is drinking, they're gonna drink and yeah. so forth. You know, you, you, you do what your friends are doing and uh, uh, there are some, yes, there are some physical desires, but there are also social pressures. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes those social pressures are greater than what, you know, like the warnings that you hear. Because yeah. the social pressures are right here and the warnings are out there someplace. Yeah. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, it's a huge part in the female epidemic around the country, even here in Binghamton, yeah. speaking to local business owners. Um, and it's sort of, you know, the concept of informed consent in yeah. terms of people being um, informed. About what? About, what? about drugs. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and what's interesting is that you look at drugs and it's sort of uh, perceived as, a, as an illness and other people look at it as a choice. Mm -hmm. um, now, philosophically, um, do you think that there is or medically, that there's a point in which um, people stop being themselves and stop having control. And oh well, yeah, sure, of course. I mean, uh, there are, there are, uh, there's a range of drugs that are, uh, to some extent or another, physiologically addictive. And um, it's interesting. This varies a lot from one person to another. Mm -hmm. So that. Um, I read someplace an interesting story about somebody who um, had never smoked, and then ju they they uh, they smoked like one cigarette, and they said something clicked into place, and I felt much better with that nicotine. And they said, "Well, okay." So, and they and then they realized smoking was going to be bad. So this is a person who actually became quote unquote addicted to nicotine patches that got on their skin mm. that they kind of needed and you know they had a, some kind of internal structure that mm -hmm. the nicotine made them more functional than they would otherwise be right mm -hmm. sort of like a chain uh, yeah yeah and and you can say that i mean certainly uh th certainly you could say that there's a whole range of different kinds of drugs that have some kind of physio physiological, psychophysiological mm -hmm. implications so that, um, and, and depending on, you know, how, uh, where somebody's at, uh, they, th th it may make them feel better uh, and I th if they can control it, they may be, it might be the right sort of thing for them. So and physicians know this and so there's a whole range of, of prescription drugs which if a person, you know, look, as far as you get the right amount, there people are gonna function better m using that specific drug if that's what they need in order to be able to function well. I mean, with, in some ways, this is sort of a medical practice. What happens is, is a lot is that people sort of self-medicate. That is, they, they discover something is, um, makes them feel better and they don't get, they don't have it controlled by anybody who's a specialist in the psychophysiological, but it really, you know, makes them feel better and so on. And this, if it, it can get out of control. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. So, so many people today, one of the f most famous things is people who become addicted to, um, to opioid painkillers and they get there because some physician has been prescribing painkillers. They, they, they've had pain and, and, they, and, they, and they want the pain relief. And so they take the painkillers and then at a certain point, uh, the prescription one, for whatever reason, becomes too expensive. And so and then they discover, oh, they get the same effect from heroin. So now, then they're, then now they're a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Y 
yeah. yourself. Yeah, and it sort of uh, it sort of ties in into mental health in the sense of yeah, um, yeah. She looks at you know feeling pain, you know. Pain right, pain right, pain right. Pain yeah. And, um, and mental health has a stigma about it. Um, so, what do you think the role in mental health awareness can do, just in general, in terms of? You know, yeah. Well, um, I think that the line that the distinction between mental health and physical health is typically drawn way too rigidly that to a very large extent um, things that we often think of or call uh, psychological illnesses are really physiological illnesses at, b at base that have that have uh, behavioral implications or that have sort of psychological I impact on consciousness, uh, th the question is that your nervous system is working in, in, in some way that might need to be regulated in some respect, right? And so, and you know, I mean, is this, is this a mental thing? It's pretty hard, not impossible, but I think pretty hard to say that these things are just sort of purely mental and there's no physical aspect, mm -hmm. right? Uh, of course, you know, to say that it's all physical is not to say exactly how. There's so much that we don't understand about how uh, different chemicals affect people um, in their behavior, in their mental attitudes, and so on. Uh, this is a th this is a very big field of investigation. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, some people are learning more about it all the time, but there's a lot more to learn. And a but as we study it, we realize, I think, that um, to say s separate out mental health and say that's a you know stigmatize that th that's as as absurd as stigmatizing women for all of the things that have to do with having babies. And there so you say, oh, you know, like, oh, she was pregnant. Ooh, this is terrible. <laughs> Wait, that, that's a, it, it's a normal <laughs> natural phenomenon, right? And you can, and it has a certain process and you can understand it and there's all the rest. Mm -hmm. So, or, <coughs> or if you say, uh, you know, like, stigmatizing somebody because they have some kind of physical difficulty because they maybe they don't hear very well. You know, like used to be, oh, there were long years, many years ago, uh, people who, who uh, couldn't hear were called deaf and dumb, and dumb meaning stupid because they couldn't hear anything. They, could, they couldn't respond to things that people were saying, right? Mm -hmm. And not dumb. They just don't hear what you're saying, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they never quite understand. Yeah, yeah, and, and right, yeah. right. And so, so th it, there is an issue of uh, trying to understand the physiological basis of the whole range of different kinds of problems that people have. And, and certainly, when we're talking about drug addiction, certainly there's a physiological basis to that. Right? Is it a moral failing? I mean, you could say, well, uh, it might have been a mistake for a person to try some drug to begin with, but you know, we, we, have to, we have to say, yelling at somebody isn't going to solve that problem. Right. And, and, and going back to your big gulp drinks, you know, I mean, if people are looking for calories, Cheap calories, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so you say, well, we're gonna we're discourage and make them a little less cheap. Yeah, okay. So, but what you need to do is to help people find things that are going to be more satisfying or yeah. more healthy. That's very true. Yeah. Now, uh, the role of universities is really big in the sense of you know whether it's mental health or physical health. Yeah. Of doing research. 
and yeah, uh, yeah, in, yeah. Bingham from Heinz does neuroscience. Sure, uh, through that's the right. Department. Yeah, that's a good chemistry department. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, and it goes to like a paradox again. It's sort of like uh, universities they might patent a drug, and then they the the cost of it might be high, but it, it's it's sort of like a, a cycle in a sense of it's good that universities do do research, but then they're not funded by the government, so they have to get profit. Well, money. yeah, I, I, I would. I not put too much emphasis on not funded by the government when you're talking about research because uh, we do have I mean, the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health uh, do uh, fund research. Obviously the funds are not unlimited but um, uh, yes the government does support a lot of the research that goes on in these areas and um, and in some respects, you know, like recently uh, Obama declared a war on cancer and put Biden in charge of this, you know, uh, sort of moonshot <laughs> expedition to get rid of cancer. I mean, as a, of course, it's a complex process, but what that means is that there was, there's really a, an intention to uh, try to reduce um, the number of, of cancers that are going in and to find ways that you can stop them once they start and all of that. So and of course, there's a lot of research in these respects, but there are some real possibilities that are opening up for people who work in that area. That's, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but uh, yeah. but that's, uh, you know, like the government does. Yeah, yeah, and, and I agree. Yeah. Yeah. The government does fund, um, of course, a lot of public institutions. Yeah. But then it comes back into even cancer research because yeah. the cost of these drugs is so high. Right. Well, it's, uh, see, one of the things about um, drug research is that you need to go through that whole process of, of uh, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three testing, you know, and all of that requires uh, time, for sure, and uh, requires people who are going to be involved in it you know, like who are going to get paid, uh, you know, and and uh, and some of the items that are produced, uh, it's 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 kind of expensive to actually produce the what you're testing. So so that um, in, in many cases, in many cases, the uh, the initial production is expensive, and as you learn how to make it, the cost can come down very dramatically. But but uh, still, um, uh, the, the cost of testing and the length of testing and, and all of that, that's a, and, and you test, what happens too is you test a lot of things and say, you know, no, that's not gonna work. <laughs> so, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> there are lots of legends about how many blind alleys some researcher went up before he found the, the right sort of thing, you know, like, uh, yeah, and, and, and it's interesting. It sort of ties into our class in a sense of yeah. testing and, you know, there's this huge potential of stem cells. You know, yeah, right. To get into ethical issues about sure, to what sure. extent should we test on, you know, fetal or, um, or fetuses to get aborted. Um, you know, yeah. Drugs yeah, right, right, right. Well, I, the, the concern there is the idea that uh, whether... whether somebody is producing fetuses in order to use them for this purpose, and that seems to be uh, disrespectful of human life. So that, that's, that's the kind of point that w was looked at there. And, 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 and really, uh, what one of the things that's, that's pretty crucial here is that you also have to pay attention to the genetic structure of the whatever tissues or pr products you are making. And so the, the really best way, if you can do it, is to use cells from the individual that you're going to try to treat. Why? Because they match genetically, they're you, you know, and where so you don't want to have rejection. I mean, you could say, 
oh, well, you know, if we, we could get stem cells and produce, I don't know, say, uh, nerve cells from the stem cells that would, could cure somebody's uh, p paralysis by connecting up the nerves. Yeah, but if you put those into this person, they may be rejected. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, tissue rejection is very serious. And he says, well, but the problem is that you can say, well, we, can, we have um, drugs that can control rejection. Yeah, but they do this by cutting down the immune response of the person that you put them into. So now, they're yeah, they're not rejecting this tissue, but they're also more susceptible to communicable diseases, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is a, uh, I mean, it's a problem with any kind of transplantation, but including anything that's based on stem cells or so on. So that, uh, so that the, the real objective is to say, can we figure out a way to grow the right sort of mm, tissues uh, from this person's own stem cells, to, you know, revert, get them to revert back to stem cell cell status and, and, and make them <laughs> grow in the right way. That, that's one of the kinds of research things that's, that's going on. And uh, um, the another thing, and of course, we're talking about cancer research, uh, another sort of thing is to be able to identify the structure of those cancer cells to realize how you can attack that particular kind of cell. This is a, an interesting kind of uh, uh, biochemical issue, you know, you could say, can we, you know, can, can we find a, a way that we can chemically identify those cancer cells and not the other cells in the person's body, so that so that so that what we're going to give this person is we'll attack the cancer cell and not not the other thing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Now, um, before we move on to moral philosophy, um, yeah. You know, again, going back to the election uh, and in class, a lot of uh, a lot of focus has been on women's health issues. Sure. And in a sense of yeah, we're uh, going to talk some more about it next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 um, sure, sure. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and, and you have people with a lot who have a lot of opinions on it. Now, uh, from your perspective, what have you found to be one of the core issues or, or in general that, you know, women face in terms of health? Um, right, right. Well, of course, uh, certainly in, in general, to have um, available uh, practitioners who are understanding of the range of health issues that women have, that specifically women have, you know, and that, um, and and there are there are serious issues about uh, certainly certain kinds of physiological processes that happen with women, but and also communicable diseases that uh, that they can get, uh, say from from sexual contact and. Uh, uh, you, you, that have pretty drastic effects sometimes on, on women. You want to be able to stop those, prevent them. Uh, and so I would say, you know, like Planned Parenthood does an enormous amount of, of health care for women who have, you know, specifically women's health issues. And they get blamed because, you know, to some little corner of their practice, they might they might be either providing or providing referrals for abortion services when there are people who, who need that. Uh, but um, of course, as I said, when we were talking, you know, like about abortion, uh, in, in my view, this is, it, yes, it's a serious ethical issue, but it's a serious ethical issue for the woman. It's not a serious ethical for you and me, right? It's their problem, okay? And, and so we're, we, we err, you and I being men, we, we, we err in saying we should control that. Why? It's their body. It's their decision. And they may have a difficult time making that decision, but it's their decision in any case, you know. And to, to, to interfere in that is, um, it just seems wrong. <laughs> it just seems wrong. It just seems wrong. Well, 
And, 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 you know, and I can say, you know, looking at it, well, yeah, are there, are, are there women who make decisions that I think are probably bad? Yeah, it happens. Probably not most of them, but could happen. Uh, but you have to understand what their, 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 their situation is. I mean, like you think, okay, uh, you know, like typically who's, who's getting abortions, if you want to talk about that specifically, uh, you know, on, wa- on the one hand, you've got very young girls who shouldn't be pregnant at all, who got pregnant and they're too young to know what the heck is going on. And you got to help them out. Okay. And then you have people who have more children than they can take care of, and they've gotten pregnant again. And, and, and really, a, a good chunk of the people who seek abortion services, and, that, and it's just they don't have a lot of control over their, their sex lives. And if they don't have control over their sex lives, then they don't have control over getting pregnant. And now, and, and now they have to decide what to do You know, when they do get pregnant. It saves the guy. Fortunately, fortunately, you know, we've got... You know, things like Plan B and Forty Forty Six, and all that, you know, I mean, that can solve these things. So, now, the the issues we've been talking about, Medicare, yeah, yeah. Uh, health issues, yeah, yeah. you know, there are issues of autonomy. Yeah. They're very philosophical. And you have uh, taught courses on Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. That's right. That's right. Well, that's what I mainly do. That's my specialization. Mm-hmm. That's right. So... W- for our viewers who may not know much about philosophy, um, yeah. what are some core ideas and, and, and core philosophies? Well, obviously, in the in the course, I put a lot of emphasis on somewhat more recent philosophies. I mean, it's kind of standard talk nowadays to compare utilitarian and deontological principles. And uh, now, more recently, there are some people who would say you need to have a more sort of pluralistic approach like uh, like Ross or have some emphasis on uh, a theory of justice like Rawls so, uh, so th- these are some of the it's a recent moves it doesn't I'm not saying what these are because it will get to be a little long any yeah. one of them yeah. uh, but um, I think that uh, Probably in in the medical area, um, what you would find is that people who are really close to the actual cases mm-hmm. will tend to use a number of different approaches mm-hmm. in attempting to explain how these um, problems can be understood. And, and I think one of the reasons for that is that uh, ultimately we are dealing with people who are not, after all, professional philosophers. Uh, on the on the healthcare side, we have physicians who may or may not be have some philosophical background. Certainly, nurses who most likely don't have much, you know. And uh, and then and then you have. Uh, families who could have a very big range of different kinds of levels of sophistication and views that they have. Uh, very often, when it comes to healthcare issues, I think uh, people come to rely, you know, as the issues become more and more critical, they come to rely more on whatever their religious background is. So it's religious. The religious views are enter in, and uh, different religious groups have interesting different mm-hmm. takes on certain issues. So uh, from time to time, I've I've introduced in the course I've introduced some of those religious differences. Um, from a philosophical point of view, from a history of philosophy point of view, uh, it really is interesting to look at the kinds of ethical theories that existed in ancient Greece for one thing because they are prior to the kind of the Christian revolution that as far as Western thought um, shaped pretty much everything in terms of uh, the Christian views and 
the Christian views really did rely to a certain extent on Greek thought, but also on biblical things, which is not Greek. But, and so, so you have this sort of mixture between, between the interpretation of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, and Greek thought that, that, that becomes um, uh, a range of different sorts of interpretations, views, uh, especially on moral issues, you know, because people think if they're going to think of some principles as far as moral issues, a lot of times they will rely on their religious background. It's very interesting. Uh, you mentioned in class you were part of an ethics board. Yes, um, yes. Uh, was, yes. was it in the, in the hospital? Well, I've been on a couple of different committees, yeah. but I, I am actually on the Lourdes Institutional Review Board at Lourdes Hospital, um, which uh, the job of that uh, committee is to look at research proposals uh, and uh, approve their application in the hospital. That is to say, what, what that means is that if somebody's going to use some people who are in the hospital as research subjects, they've got to go through this committee to, and, and that the, this committee looks at to see that the, the research is being done ethically. So, it, you know, ethics and philosophy have its tentacles sort of everywhere. Yeah, I guess you could say. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think it's really necessary that such a committee have a philosopher on it, but um, I, I, I do think that it's true that uh, um, Lourdes Hospital, being a Catholic hospital, is very open to having philosophical input because uh, philosophy is a central part of Catholic higher education. So that uh, although I'm not a Catholic, I certainly am very well aware of, of the Catholic views on, on things and, uh, and can sort of interpret, you know, the Catholic views in terms of uh, some of the other non-Catholic ethical views. I mean, I could translate between. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, what's interesting about uh, ethics boards, uh, you know, in 2008, you know, certain Republicans believe that, you know, these panels are death panels. And uh, Oh, well, that question, not, not institutional review board. Mm -hmm. The death panel thing, uh, actually, it's interesting that, uh, that some of the proposals that have been put forward by the Republicans uh, to uh, control medical costs uh, do have what they were complaining about as death panels back in 2008. What that is, is look, supposing that you're going to control costs, okay, and the question is where are you going to control costs? And two of the most expensive things that you can do are Number one, uh, maintaining people who are really never going to regain consciousness uh, in a hospital setting mm -hmm. for like any significantly long period of time. And you can say, but why are we doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, now the question is, and, and the other thing is, uh, the neonatal intensive care unit, right? Mm -hmm. So you have extremely low birth weight, very premature babies. Take a, it's very expensive to take care of them. As you get down in in, in the birth weight, uh, basically, uh, the more expensive and longer you're going to have them there. You know, and it, that, that's that's expensive too. So, so this this kind of intensive care in hospitals is a big expense. How are we going to control it? Have a committee. That's a depth panel. Why? Because it says, you say, well, all right, we're trying to decide at what point do we take a baby out of the intensive care unit and, and stop, stop treating them. Or we have somebody, you know, like you have, I'd say, Karen Quinlan, you know? Okay. So who's going to decide how long Karen Quinlan is going to stay on life support? You know, and supposing, of course, in that case, you had her, her parents, you know, said, 
take her off, you know, it's a, they're all big debate, you know, or you know, between the, and, and you have, um, certainly you have families who, who might say kind of contradictory things, you know, so, so you had the Minnesota case where the husband is saying, no, oh, I want my wife kept on life support. She was brain dead, you know, but okay. You know, and yeah. so, so, so how are you going to decide? And you can say, well, um, in a sense, you, you, the, to a large extent, it gets to be the individual attending physician, but individual attending physicians can vary quite a lot in what they, in what they do. And, and of course, as you, you, you can say, well, it's some negotiation that goes on. Eventually, eventually, you, you might want to say, you know, is it going to go to court? You know, it, 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 a judge should, should decide. Maybe that's what we have to do, but it, it, it seems sort of like that's not the judge's decision. It's a medical decision, right? Because yeah. really what we want to say is, is this person going to be able to recover any useful level of consciousness and yeah. interrelationship with people? And if the and, and if the doctors agree, no, it's not going to happen. They're really never going to be conscious again. Then why are we spending a huge amount of money keeping them alive? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and it also ties into um, the the topic we talked about in terms of you know young people feeling that they're invincible. In <laughs> yeah, the right, of, right, right, uh, right. Just right. smoking it, and I think it comes down to education and also having these conversations. You yeah, know, end of yeah, life care yeah. and. Um, in terms of cancer, I watched this documentary, Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies. And, yeah, um, yeah. What they highlighted is that, you know, doctors talking to patients about, you know, how, what is a good death? Yes, And it's sure. sort of this philosophical stigma, you know, sure. just, just in the sense that we tend to want to hope for the best and we tend to want to live life in the moment. And, you know, if, you know, God forbid, somebody becomes uh, in a vegetative state, they probably did not foresee this happening and they don't have yeah, something yeah. written down. Yeah. Um, so it's a matter of being informed, but it's also right, a matter of having right, these deep right. conversations. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, certainly uh, to have advanced directives <laughs> helps a lot, yes. Yeah. yeah, it does, yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining me. Yeah, it's, okay, it's great. Been a pleasure. And, thank uh, you very much. Yes. I enjoy it too. All right.